now then, there's nothing of go on there. Departing. Act or even. This is act or even. I'll departing. Mainton was the next stop. I could get back to the mainland and miss the Siltons from here. Mainton, this is Mainton. back out to the mainland. took the fisherman's boat to the old man's estate.
Now then, there's nothing go on there. When I got back to the house, it was quite late, so everyone was going to bed. For once Alice wasn't smoking her smelly tobacco, and was actually the first one asleep. And so, I actually felt quite peaceful, as I made myself comfortable for the night. Japan calling. This is Japan calling. Came the voice again as the screen crackled into life. Heather leapt across the room. This is Nighthawk, she said. We're receiving you. What happened, Elba? Dr. Hero sounded so happy to speak to us. He explained that they were forced deeper into their bunker. He said they had lost many good people, but managed to fight off the robots. Well, said the old lady, we're nearly halfway there. As long as we get the last few bits we need, we should be able to broadcast the nice virus in a matter of weeks. Do not worry, said Dr. Hero. We will survive.
This was one of the most valuable things I'd seen. I didn't know how much this was worth, but it looked expensive. seem quite valuable. Now, this was clearly worth something. Some things were worth less junk, but this could be sold for a decent price. This was one of the most valuable things I'd seen. room turned out to be a cinema, but before I could have a proper look around, the professor appeared again. He looked confused and then disappointed, that it was, as he put it, the wrong time. But I was so excited when he explained that I could plug myself into the cinema projector, and watch my old memories. He also fished out an old gramophone which apparently I would be able to plug myself into, allowing me to play music I had heard. To top this all off he opened another portal back to the hallway, but he had just finished setting up the gramophone when again, before we could properly thank him, he was gone.
this door look big and important, I would need another security pass to open it.
I didn't know how much this was worth, but it looked expensive. This seemed quite valuable. This was clearly worth something. The robot sounded just like me, but much deeper when he said, Prepare to die.
that came from this robot was a large deflated rubber ball. I had no idea what it was, but Heather fitted the power up in a matter of minutes. It wasn't perfect but she made it work. Heather explained that by tapping the up button twice, then pressing the run button, I would be able to inflate a large helium balloon. I would then be able to float upwards for a short period of time. lady took the circuitry from me when I got back. While I was gone, Mr. Deck had tried to escape so Mr. Logan was now literally holding his chain, just like the dog. The blind man had finished up the wiring so we went to the roof to attach the satellite, and prepare for broadcasting the nice virus. When we got down from the roof, everyone was really happy with how the satellite dishes were going, except Mr. Deck. When Mr. Preston laughed and told him to cheer up, he went into a rage, shouting, I hope this all goes horribly wrong, I will double cross you all at the earliest opportunity. All right Deck, said Mr. Silton, back to the dog bed with you.
Japan must have different clocks to us. As it was barely daybreak when Dr. Hiro's next communication came through. It was amazing. He really had managed to find a few other groups of survivors. So, these are our saviors, said the French scientist. A band of thieves, some old ladies and a little girl. Well, they've done better than we have, laughed the big German man. There are no bad robots where they are. The Frenchman smirked. Except for the three stood behind them. Those are our friends, said Heather, quick as ever to defend us. Guys, say hello. So there is hope, said the American scientist. The nice virus really does work. I've had Junior working on a similar virus but the consciousness software is too well coded. It's okay, said the old lady, the virus really does work. The next day, Heather tried to finish off the nice virus code. There were a few problems but, with a bit of help from the old lady, everything eventually worked. However, by the time we were done, it was quite late. And, as Heather's nice virus code would take a few hours to compile, the old lady suggested we take it easy for the evening. She rummaged through her suitcase and pulled out a pack of what she called, cards. For some reason this offended the blind man who didn't want to play, and Mrs. Silton refused as she seemed to think it was some kind of gambling. But everyone else gathered around the table. The old lady had explained that the rules involved lying, or bluffing, as she put it so everyone would be trying to work out what each other's cards were. I think the pressure of playing got to Alice, as she folded, almost straight away. At one point, Mr. Preston thought he had won, but he really hadn't. As usual, <coughs> Sim's sneeze gave him away, which made us all laugh. At one point there was a very tense standoff. Mr. Silton had some very good cards, but not as good as Mr. Dick. Soon, it came down to Mr. Logan, Heather, and myself. Then, just me and Heather. Despite having the best cards possible, I decided to let Heather win. I was so pleased how happy this made her. It was nearly midnight by the time the game finished, so most people got ready for bed. Leaving just me, Mr. Preston and Mr. Logan. Mr. Preston was trying to explain his conspiracy theories. This made Mr. Logan laugh. Barry already told you all that was nonsense, but Mr. Preston continued. Don't listen to Silton, he's a proper cut. However Mr. Logan still pointed out how flawed his logic was. For one, everyone who he claimed was in the shadowy syndicate ruling the world from behind the scenes, were the same people who actually ruled the world, the Queen of England, the President of America, etc. He wasn't even swayed when Mr. Logan pointed out that these people had either been missing or dead since the war, so there was little chance anyone was even ruling the world these days. Mr. Preston paused briefly, then smiled the smile of a man confident in his own beliefs, and went to bed. Which left just me and Mr. Logan talking. He was an interesting man, but we'd never really chatted as he'd made it quite clear he didn't really like robots. He'd seen many friends killed by them during the war so I could kind of see his point. I tried to explain that I had once accidentally killed an old man, and I still felt complete regret. That's good. You never really get over it. He said as he looked around. Time for bed. Good night.
Very early the next morning, a terrified-looking Dr. Hero appeared on the screen. Our defenses are nearly breached, the last door could go at any moment. We are nearly ready to broadcast the nice virus, said the old lady. But her expression soon turned to confusion. Where's the American scientist? They never saw it coming, said Dr. Hero. Just like here, thousands of robots, all attacking at once. Heather looked like she was going to burst into tears. There were no survivors, said the French scientist. It was all so quick. It was strange. Although we'd only spoken to the Americans once, I could tell everyone felt a huge sense of loss. We may have a problem here too, interrupted Sim. The robot server, it's become sentient. The computer that runs everything, he really is now he, or at least he thinks he is. The blind man explained that it was the wireless fidelity system that would have linked him to the four main robots. That's why they were all so clever, said the old lady. The network spread the intelligence around all four of them. Well, said Mr. Silton, five now. Sim explained I would need to force a power cycle on the sever, before we sent the signal, he's got so much control of the network now, he could probably shut the satellite back down before we'd even started setting it up. The old lady rummaged around in a few boxes, here, she said as she gave me a passkey, take this, it'll get you into the observatory in the attic, that's where he is, 